And if you're able, please stand and turn in your order of worship to hear God's call to worship him. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are honored by all who believe in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Amen. And please remain standing for our first hymn. And that hymn is 734. Be strong in the Lord.
Bibles to the book of Habakkuk. And while you're doing that, uh, I think uh, I told Pete before we began this morning that I feel that I might be responsible for this heat wave. I uh, asked God a while back, I was so, so frustrated by all the windy days that we've had, I said, Lord, what it will it take to just get a handful of non-windy days in the high desert? Turns out the answer to that question is eight days of a, well in excess of 100 degrees. So I will not be asking that question again anytime in the near future. Habakkuk chapter 1, we'll look at uh, Habakkuk's second complaint. We'll begin reading at verse 12 of chapter 1 and continue through verse 4 of chapter 2. My brothers and sisters, this is the very word of God. Let us give it careful attention. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. For you are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, Wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. So far, the reading of God's word. Would you join me in prayer? Our Father and our God, we thank you for this time together as your children to sit under your word, to hear your word to us. And Father, by the Spirit's ministry, to have that word used in our hearts and our minds, to help us gain wisdom, to help us gain understanding, to have our faith renewed in the one true God and your word. For that purpose, Father, I ask that you would please bless my thoughts and words so that they would glorify you alone and that they would be food for your sheep. In Christ's name, amen. Well, last week we began our journey through the minor uh, prophet Habakkuk as we considered the first complaint that the prophet brought to the Lord. Uh, He was quite, as we found, quite troubled with the condition of, of God's own people. And he was calling out to God to say, what's going on here? You, you, you see how they are living. You see how they are defying your commands. And you don't seem to be doing anything about it. He was absolutely troubled to his soul at the way that God's own people were living their daily lives in absolute disregard to the truth of God's word. We might even say that he was troubled by the fact that looking out at God's people and the nations around him, you could barely tell the difference between the believers and the non-believers. And with that, almost no difference between the culture and God's church. And it was troubling to him. It was troubling to him because of the apparent inactivity of God. He says, you don't seem to be doing anything about this. People are going to think you're weak. 
People think you're going to be like that parent that always threatens punishment, but never actually delivers. Oddly enough, that's one of the chief complaints of unbelieving world, right? You're God, you Christians believe in. Look at the condition of this world. He doesn't seem to be doing anything about it. How can you say he exists as a good God when the world is such a ruin? The inactivity of God is always a problem or a blessing to the unbeliever and sometimes a challenge to the believer. He's asking him, you made a covenant with us and you threatened to do certain things if we violated the terms of that covenant and you're not doing anything. Well, what did he Habakkuk's answer. Oh, I'm, I'm doing something. See, see, the, see how those uh, Babylonians are getting stronger and stronger and greater and greater? I'm going to use them as my instrument of judgment. So if Habakkuk was troubled at his first complaint, now that he's gotten that answer, he's even what? More troubled. He's struggling even more with things. As I said last week, to the first answer, You're going to do what? You're going to use who? The Babylonians is your method? Come on. I wanted you to do something, but this isn't what I had in mind. Anybody ever been there? God, I've I've been petitioning you about this matter, but you're doing something now finally, and this is not what I had in mind. The last part of verse 11 is the perfect transition into his second complaint. Look look back, if you will, at that very last line of chapter 11. Speaking of those Babylonians that he is going to use as an instrument of judgment, they're described as guilty men whose own might is their God. A people so powerful that now they become their own God. Look at how mighty we are. We're the world's superpower. We don't need God. We have us. This brings to the front the very complaint that Habakkuk continues to struggle with. God, I confessed in my prayer, as as your people, we're living terrible. But they're worse. And you're going to use them? You're you're going to use a a people that have no regard for you whatsoever. And to everybody watching, you using them and raising them to power is going to make it look like you favor them. How can you do such a thing? The interesting thing is that when God answered his first complaint, the Lord began by telling Habakkuk that He's doing something that he wouldn't believe if he told them. And then what does God do? He tells them what he's going to do. He tells them what he's going to do. I thought you said I wasn't going to understand. You see, we have to understand that there's a difference. There's a difference between seeing what God is doing and understanding what God is doing. Listen to me carefully, brothers and sisters. Listen. There is a difference between seeing what God is doing in his universe, in his creation, and understanding what he is doing. We see what he is doing all the time, and we fool ourselves into thinking that we understand what he is doing by our own feeble senses. We must call ourselves into check on that. Because what we see is only a small part of what he is actually doing. God is so vast, so complex, so wise, so powerful, that that's the part that he couldn't explain to Habakkuk. I can tell you what I'm about to do, but for you to understand all the variables 
involved and what the results of it are going to be like that in the lives of both those who I give my blessing to and those who I will curse. I couldn't be, it's so complex, you couldn't understand it if you wanted to. That's the difference. You see, the heart of Habakkuk's second complaint is this. You're the, you're the holy Lord of creation, the sovereign of history. You are so holy and so pure that you can't possibly do something that appears to me to be so unholy. And there lies the problem. It appears to me to be unholy. God can't ever do anything that is actually unholy, friends, regardless of our temporal judgment on anything. And he confesses that. Did did you see how he worked that one little line in? We will not die. I hear what you're saying. I hear these Babylonians are coming. They have a reputation of just absolutely devastating everything they march over the top of. But I have a confidence, Lord. Even though I don't like what I'm hearing and I don't understand it, we will not die. Why? Because he knows. He knows who the Lord is. You have made precious promises to Father Abraham, to us as your people. Your covenant was founded on the fact that you cannot fail to deliver your promises. You made it clear. If you've been studying with me through Genesis, you know about Genesis 15 and that elaborate covenant cutting ceremony where God says, if I fail to bring my promises about, may I suffer the same fate as these cut apart animals. Habakkuk understands all of this. He's just struggling to understand why God is answering his complaint in the way that he is. It seems to him absolutely wrong-headed that God would take this course of action. It's not consistent, he says, with your holiness. You seem to be acting as though people are no value than are of no more value than fish who the fisherman just comes up and catches up as many as he wants, an inexhausting supply with his dragnet. How can any good come out of this, God? Ever been there? John Flavel, uh, a, an old preacher of England and somebody you're not familiar with, I wish you were, he wrote a wonderful book that I highly recommend to you, F-L-A-V-E-L, John Flavel, wrote a book on providence many, many years ago. Still the best book I've ever written, or read, written. I have all these unpublished works you don't know about. Uh, Ever, ever written. Uh, John Flavel was a preacher in England a couple centuries ago, and and, um, he was preaching on one Sunday morning when he he just felt that the church was going through a very dry period. A little bit discouraged, he, he remembers preaching one morning before a Sunday service. He said, God, just please bless the preaching of your word today that we might see one convert today. Preached a wonderful sermon, got through it all, no response. Waited days and days after that Sunday, no response. Later, a man named Luke Short, who immigrated to New England, had become a farmer, was celebrating in some days after his 100th birthday and considering all the blessings in his life. The blessing of a long life and and how successful his farming had been and how wonderful his family had had become. But felt like something was missing. And walking one day after that 100th birthday through a field contemplating a sermon that he heard 85 years ago from John Flavel, was converted to Christ. God's timing doesn't always work out to our convenience. His providence will not often come with the dog and pony show that we so much desire. But it always comes. 
Habakkuk realizes that whatever God is doing, it is beyond his capacity of understanding. He can't begin to plumb the depths of why God is doing things the way he's doing them, or even how he is doing them. And that's something that we need to appreciate. That God is doing so many things simultaneously. That his abilities, you know, for several years in the past decade, we have used a term in our culture about, uh, the term is multitasking. Well, recently they have found out that nobody actually multitasks. The human brain can only concentrate actually on one thing at a time. What they have found is that people that we call multitaskers are just better at constantly shifting gears. Some of you have rusty transmissions and you just don't do it really at all at all. (laughs) But see, God's different. God is the true multitasker. He works on all things simultaneously. You see, you and I have a a mind, a blessed mind given to us by God, but our minds work in a linear fashion. We understand this and this and this and this. We build one step at a time. God understands things in a whole different way. He understands the very beginning to the end of history and everything in with full comprehension constantly. Meditate upon that for a little while to blow your mind. He's accounting for every single variable that you and I aren't even aware of constantly in his workings in this creation. Constantly. When I worked as a police officer, I remember pulling a duty to sit on a house where a warrant had been served on this house, and I was just there to secure it while the detectives did their work. It was part of an ongoing big narcotics operation and I remember talking to a sergeant who had worked as a detective for a long time and said you know you guys got everything you need why don't you just arrest everybody and he was explaining to me that the way this worked is they were letting things play out over a series of weeks and months in order that all the guilty people could pile up all the guilt that they needed to where it wouldn't even hardly be a trial But they were doing more than just letting them pile up the amount of things they were guilty about. They were also identifying people in the shadows who they didn't know whether they were involved in the operation or not. This principle is one that God still uses himself. I said last week that I am greatly troubled, not only at the state of our country, but the state of the church in North America. I am not a prophet nor the son of a prophet but I do work for a nonprofit. <laughs> That's the last dad joke, I promise. I am, I am not a prophet, and I'm not saying I know what God is doing. I want to be clear about that. But it wouldn't surprise me one bit if what he's doing right now is letting all the false teachers and false leaders in both the country and the church pile up their guilt so that he can identify these false teachers, and on that day of judgment, they have nothing to say. You do understand that false teachers are a huge problem in the church this day. Huge problem. James 3.1, let not many of you brothers become teachers, for we know that teachers will be judged, what? More strictly. Jesus talked about this problem of the wheat and tares growing up together in his great Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7. May I read a little bit of that to you? I think I will. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me on that day, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. I had the privilege of taking a class or two under Dr. R.C. Sproul. Dr. Sproul called this the scariest verses in the entire Bible. Because why we're obsessed with asking people if they know Jesus. He says, it seems to me from Matthew chapter 7, the real question is, does Jesus know you? 
let me, let me add a little explanation to that. That is not non-believers addressing the Lord. Those are supposed believers addressing the Lord. The repetition of the Lord, Lord is key. They are claiming to have had this intimate relationship with him by the repetition of the name. These are supposed believers saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we preach, a, a, didn't we bring great prosperity? Didn't we rock, run up and, and have great, uh, wonderful uh, pep rallies? And, and didn't we do all these? Uh, and he's going to say, uh, who are you again? You never belong to me. Depart from me. It may be that the tough time that we're all having to go through is God allowing for the false teachers and false leaders to pile up their guilt. So what's our job? To be the church. To preach the truth, even if nobody wants to hear it. To stand firm on our watchtower and say, this is your word. I don't care if nobody believes it, which is never a possibility. He will always maintain a remnant. The question is, can we live faithfully as a minority? Or is that too challenging for us? Can we only be bold and steadfast for Christ provided we get to live in the special little bubble? That's a question we all have to ask ourselves, brothers and sisters. Both as a church and as individual believers. You see, God's answer to these difficulties is at the heart of this passage in verse 4. The righteous shall live by his faith. It goes clear back to Abraham. In chapter 15 of verse 6, when, when Abraham is struggling to believe these wonderful promises that God has made him, and he sees no evidence of them even remotely, closely coming true. And so he says to God in chapter 15, could you help me believe here? And in verse 6 of chapter thing, it says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. What's the it? His belief in God's word. God, I don't see how this is about to come true. It doesn't seem to be even close in my lifetime. It's not playing out like I planned for. But you said it. I believe it. Remember that bumper sticker that was so popular back in the 80s and 90s that I took issue with all those years ago? For some of you who have been around for a long time. There was a bumper sticker that was very popular. It said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And I took issue with it. Because the middle part needs to be cut out. I believe it does not make it so. God said it, that settles it. Whether you believe it or not, pal, is your own problem. God's word is God's word. It's not just a private answer here for Habakkuk. He is answering Habakkuk's prayerful complaint, his petition. But the Lord wants to make sure that he knows that he's not just giving him an individual answer. He says, write it on the tablets. This, this, this is the same word that's used in Deuteronomy to refer to the stone tablets that have the Ten Commandments. Write it down for posterity. My answer to your question of how are we going to live through this is for the life of the church. The righteous shall live by faith, not by sight. God will be using the wicked Babylonians. And the timing you may have to wait for it a while, but God's timing is God's timing. He has firmly decided it, so write it on the stone tablets because it's not going to change. It'll happen at just the right time. But he doesn't fail to make a distinction. That's where the second half of verse 4 comes in. Yes, you're going to see a terrible period of judgment. 
and I'm going to separate the wheat from the tares. I'm going to show who really belonged to the kingdom of God and who was just playing church. But the righteous shall live by faith. The Apostle Paul quotes this second half of the verse 4, Habakkuk 2.4, twice in two letters. I'm sorry, once in each letter. Two letters, Romans and Galatians. At very critical junctions of his arguments that he's explaining to these new Christians. In chapter 1 of Romans, where he's laying all of mankind under the guilt of and corruption, and condemnation of sin. Verse 17, he says, but the righteous shall live by faith. In Galatians, the same thing when he's he's fussing with an argument. He's fussing with these Pharisees. I should have picked a different word. Uh, Fussing with the Pharisees is hard to say. Um, About What works are necessary to guarantee salvation? He quotes Habakkuk 2.4. The righteous shall live by faith, not by works. Do you know the difference ultimately between us here and the unbelieving world out there? It is not that they are sinners and we are not. It is that we are repentant sinners and they are unrepentant. They do not believe that there is a holy God who calls all men to obedience. They do not believe that there's an actual judgment. Or, at the very worst, they believe that somehow they can pass the judgment because, after all, God grades on a curve. I'm not as bad as those people. The problem is God's standard for heaven is perfect obedience. His son's life. How do you measure up to that standard, friends? The righteous shall live by faith. And that faith is a gift of God. It comes from outside ourselves through the Spirit from God as a gift to us, a new heart that is now tuned to God's voice and wants to hear God's voice, even when God's voice says things to you that are very uncomfortable. Who wants to vote for the fact that you have some parts of the Bible that you wish it didn't say? Because you struggle with it. But it's God's word. You see, Habakkuk, in writing this oracle, is recording for all of us to say, you know what I found out? God can be trusted. In the midst of getting an answer of what he's going to do, and I didn't like any of it, and it didn't seem right to me, and it didn't seem like the right thing to me, God can be trusted. He knows what he's doing. Wait in faith. Watch and see what God does and don't forget that you don't understand all that God is doing. The righteous shall live by faith. That same Apostle Paul, who would quote Habakkuk 2.4 in the first chapter, writes some wonderful words that I believe the prophet Habakkuk, many many years later, may have had an opportunity to understand from heaven. You know, it's that favorite verse, Romans 8.28. Everybody loves 8.28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those called according to his purpose. He knows what he's doing, folks. Don't think because what you see happening means that you understand all that he is doing. And remember how that eighth chapter ends. Some of the most beautiful words penned in all of Scripture. Hear God's word, brothers and sisters. 
For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for Habakkuk's message. We thank you for how it calls us up short. How it reminds us that our, I, our understanding, our ability to comprehend is greatly, greatly finite compared to your infinite wisdom. Help us be patient with your ways. But Father, more than else, help us be faithful in the midst of circumstances that we do not like, that we do not care for, and wish we're radically different. Let us cling to your gospel promises. Let us in faith stand up for the right things and know that you are guiding all of history and working all things to the good of those who love you and only for those who are called according to your purposes. Father, we praise your name. Our trust and our comfort is in who you are alone. Amen. Our final hymn is 712, the wonderful hymn based on the Greek Finlandia. Be still, my soul, shall we stand together. Now, brothers and sisters, 
May the love of God our Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with and among you both now and forever. Go from this place and love one another, even as God in Christ has loved you. Amen.